Welcome to Conversatio, the Belmont Abbey College podcast. This podcast aims to form and transform our community so that each of us can reflect God's image. I'm Dr. Erin Jensen, Associate Professor of English, um, I, one of your co-hosts here for today's episode, and I'm joined by my co-host, Dr. Daniel Hutchinson, Associate Professor of History. Uh, we're excited to talk about the use of AI in higher education, uh, but I'll let Daniel introduce himself more fully. Uh, thanks, Aaron. Um, welcome. We're excited today to talk about the impact of AI on higher education. Ever since the arrival of ChatGPT in, I guess, November of last year, uh, the world of higher education and industry and technology in general has sort of been catching up to the major changes and innovations that have come with this technology, and we as educators are trying to figure out how to use this technology with our students, but also to ensure that they use it ethically and wisely. And it's an exciting time, I think, in the world of technology and, and education. Absolutely. And we co-authored an article about using AI in our classes, and so we'll share some of that mm -hmm. in, in this um, podcast, as well as both of us have been uh, further engaged in learning about and talking about, and in your case, coding, mm -hmm. <laughs> and working uh, in AI. So we plan on sharing that as well. Um, we have some questions that we're going to use to help facilitate our conversation. Uh, I will start mm -hmm. off with the first one. Uh, what are the current applications of artificial intelligence in higher education, and how are they transforming the learning experience for students? Mm, great question. Every day there seems like there's a new application, there's a new model, there's a new approach to using artificial intelligence to deal with text, with images, with music, with voices. So every day it seems to be a new frontier of technology and education. Um, and how it's going to transform the learning experience for our students, I honestly have no idea. Uh, <laughs> I think it will bring some really transformative positives. I think and this is going to date myself terribly, but I remember when search engines became one of the new oh, technologies absolutely. and transformed how we did research, um, and there were fears that you could just download papers off the internet and submit them as your own. Um, I think AI is going to provide us as instructors and students challenges on and opportunities to access information in new and really exciting ways, but also some real challenges for us as instructors to create a learning space where um, where work's done fairly and equitably and, and in a way that actually forms you know, minds and, and people. Um, but of all the applications, I think the one, the one that's most familiar to pretty much everyone's ChatGPT, this right. um, interactive artificial intelligence model or large language model by which you can ask it questions about nearly everything under the sun and it will give you an answer that's sometimes uh, mostly accurate, but with right. some important caveats. Um, so I think those are some uh, ChatGPT and its brethren. There's Bard with Google, Anthropic has a model called Claude. I think these are some of the big ones that um, are transforming our classrooms right now. Absolutely, and I would just say on that mm -hmm. to also date. I learned to type on a typewriter. Yeah. Um, not because computers didn't exist, but I think partly because of the socioeconomic mm -hmm. background of the high school I went to. But uh, and I, I just think that I, as I have had these conversations with my fellow colleagues and with students and and greater research communities that that we look at AI as a tool that right when the computer really uh, became dominant in the classrooms and everyone had their laptops and right the fear was and, and I remember sitting in conversations as a grad student that the computer was going to think for students and if they stopped handwriting it they weren't going to real is it really their creation and I think we've largely moved beyond that to realize the um, the value of computers mm -hmm. in our educational system. But I think AI, it's again that, and I, I think both of us look at it as much of, uh, it's a tool, it's a tool to help us in teaching, it's a tool to help students in learning. Uh, yes, it has long reaching applications as well as implications, but as with anything, it's a technology tool and how you use it and how you talk to your students about it um, can be, uh, a positive impact or a negative impact, but it, it really comes down, in my mind, to it's it's one of many tools that we have to use with students. Yeah, I agree um, wholeheartedly. Maybe we can talk about uh, our paper a little bit and some okay. of the ways Absolutely. we used AI to, to work with students. Yeah, definitely. Um, so uh, last spring, 
spring, um, Aaron and I conducted a sort of an experiment um, or an, a classroom assignment with students in which they would use AI to try to understand a text. In my case, it was the Declaration of Independence. Students would read that and sort of um, use that text to mess around with the AI. You, you, yours was in a rhetoric. It was a rhetorical analysis, yeah. which anyone who's had freshman composition will recognize it as that is one of the hallmark assignments that across the country, everyone in freshman composition does. A rhetorical analysis where you look at the argument that, um, that an, something is being made. In our case, we were looking at song lyrics, but we re did a lot of readings about rhetorical analysis and that's what we used it for. Yeah. So what do you think um, you found as an instructor most interesting, most revealing, most, you know, what was the big takeaways that jumped out at you from sort of running this assignment? Right, absolutely. Uh, and if you've read our article, <laughs> you had the more creative approach to it. And I was like, here, students, here are these articles about rhetorical analysis. Let's read them and use, um, in our case, explain paper mm -hmm. to uh, help with the comprehension. So I always find that students really struggle with this assignment because they're not used to talking about rhetoric and looking at Aristotle's ethos, logos, and pathos, and the vocabulary that comes with it. So I really used Explain Paper to have students upload the different articles we were reading into Explain Paper, and then within that app, you can copy paragraphs and have the AI um, uh, explain it mm -hmm. in more plain language and easier to understand language. You can also have conversations with the bot. And so I had students um, had a selection of various articles they could choose, upload, and then have conversations and say, well, I think it means this, and then see how it related to what AI came up mm -hmm. as, as what the paragraphs meant. And then students could look at the paragraphs they created in summary and look at the AI created summary and compare them and see where they agreed and where they disagreed and where there was disagreement. It led to great conversations. Mm -hmm. And so I found for, from a reading comprehension as well as uh, understanding them enough to then use and then apply them into an essay, that's really where I saw the main uh, benefit mm -hmm. to using that particular one is that students, I really felt like students through using Explain Paper were able to get a better understanding of a rhetorical analysis than they had with previous semesters that I had not used that. Yeah, well, that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, our class looked at the Declaration of Independence, which is a text that students are all aware of, but it is written in 18th century English, referring to big philosophical ideas, but also sometimes really obscure historical details. And the goal for this particular assignment, also using Explain Paper, students would upload the declaration and ask uh, the AI questions about um, parts of the text that they found interesting, challenging, difficult to understand. And I wanted them to sort of experiment with finding out for themselves where the AI excelled and where it didn't. For example, one area that it seemed to do pretty good at is explaining things in, I want to say, sort of culturally relevant terms. So there might be a passage that is, in, in a sense, completely alien to the student, but you can ask the AI, well, explain this to me through the lens of my favorite pop culture uh, example. So you could have it explained through Pride and Prejudice as one student picked, or um, the Marvel Cinematic Universe in another one. Create a familiar sort of cultural framework that you're used to, and the AI then can sort of, in a sense, translate that in a way that students can make sense of. Um, and that was an effective use that I think students uh, found helpful. One area that I think was also really important for uh, my class, I think those of us exploring AI in general need to sort of communicate is where the AI comes up short. So for example, there are um, individuals or passages in the declaration in which the AI doesn't know a lot. Mm -hmm. And so I asked the students to pick a particular aspect and really try to probe and ask specific questions and fact check the AI. And sometimes the AI knocked it out of the park, and sometimes the AI made it up. But it was, it's very difficult to know that unless you are a subject expert. And so one of the goals was to teach students where this thing can be really effective for summarizing, for right. explaining. Mm -hmm. But for certain areas like fact checking or some elements of factual detail, it's not always accurate, and it's hard to know when it's not accurate. So you have to use this very carefully. And this actually came up in an English departmental meeting mm -hmm. where I was encouraging my fellow English professors to use ChatGPT and, and mm -hmm. explain paper. And, and several of them had mentioned that they'd used it in their classes as they were teaching literature <laughs> and had discovered, again, that AI, ChatGPT, and explain paper were not very helpful when you asked 
I can't even think of a specific, but uh, whatever they were reading, whatever literature, you know, the study guide questions, uh, what character, you know, proposed to what character, or the, even the names that they just, um, obviously that AI just scanned through the basic characters and, and included uh, random information. So when it came to the really specifics of, it did pretty well on theme mm -hmm. apparently, and it did pretty well on like main storyline, but when it got into the really nitty gritty details of that piece of literature, and the more obscure literature obviously did even worse, that was not where it was very successful. I will say on my side where I teach writing classes and don't teach literature, and in general don't teach really specific um, like data or stats or things like that, it works It works well, and, and I will say my other class I teach, not so much in our article, but I do a lot of journal, I have students read a lot of research journals and find Explain Paper to be really good at helping students get a better understanding. Journal articles are hard to read for anyone, yeah. right? They're written out for other professors to read very high level of, aca, um, of academics, and so I find that Explain Paper can do a really good job with that summary. Yeah. Um, did you get a sense of all of the impressions the students had using Explain right. Paper? I mean, what do they, what do they think about it? I, I thought students were thrilled. I, I think a lot of students were initially a little bit taken aback mm -hmm. by it because we did our study relatively uh, the semester it came out. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So it was. I mean, I think students now are a little bit more accustomed to hearing about AI, but when we were first talking, I know I had students who'd never even heard of it, mm -hmm. and they're like, "What are you talking about?" And it's like. Well, here's what we're talking about. And so I think students are a little bit reticent to, to attempt it. I, in one of my classes, we weren't able to access it in the classroom, and so we had to go out onto the lawn and, uh, and access it there. Um, and, and using hotspots and cell phones and right, all those lovely things, which is what happens with technology. Yeah. That class in particular seemed uh, not very verbal on, on what they love but this. In the next class, that it did work in the classroom, we were able to it. Really saw, I think, a lot of benefits to mm -hmm. understanding text that they were struggling to understand, and really excited for the implications yeah. of it. Yeah, I, I, th I think I get the same thing from my students that they there were some who were extremely excited about what this technology could represent. Right. In a sense, having a conversation with your homework or with right. you know your object of study, and there, some of them were very thrilled by that. But there were others who. Um, offered insights, which I thought were very mature, that they said this could become very easy to over rely upon. This could right. be, there'd be a very strong temptation to simply just have ChatGPT generate your papers or your quizzes or assignments. Right. And there was a sense that um, that that this technology is very powerful, but we don't necessarily have the powerful sort of social constraints to use it quite yet in place. Right. And so. I think I think students like us are um, trying to figure it out because right. for them it's not just their classes; it's going to be their jobs and their futures too. Absolutely. So absolutely. Well, and I would say now using it because I am assuming you as kids mm -hmm. continue to use it. So have I in my classes. Um, I find students in this semester that as I've been using and asking for feedback, a lot of students feel as if if they're using ChatGPT in their other classes, they have to keep it hidden. Mm -hmm. And so having those very open conversations with students about. Um, the cheating aspects, right? Because that's definitely a consideration. ChatGPT in many ways makes it much easier to cheat. Mm -hmm. uh, plagiarism implications, but having those open conversations with students about ways to use it ethically mm -hmm. and ways to use it to really help with understanding and reading uh, comprehension and uh, et cetera, et cetera, has been, um, I find that students are have been open about their use. I think almost all of my students have at least accessed ChatGPT mm -hmm. at some point, whether or not they use it regularly or not, but um, I think a lot of students aren't sure who to turn to to have those conversations, and so one of my recommendations in general and as, that I've made to in various areas is that we need to be open with our students about AI, about what it can do, as well as the limitations, as well as when and when not to use it. Yeah, um, I think that as we proceed over the next few years, it'll be, um, a big learning curve for us as, an, as educators, but also for our students. But in five or 10 years from now, um, will students who have grown up with us even think of it as remarkable or unique? I mean, that seems to be the way with all of our technologies. They're, right. they're miracles and they're wonders and then they're, they're everyday commonplace. Um, but as that transition occurs, 
we've got a lot to do in trying to figure out how to effectively and ethically and appropriately yeah, put all the stuff together. Absolutely, yeah. and use it and teach our students how to use it. Yeah. yeah. Um, what, so one of the questions on here is what role do students have to play in this? Um, I'm really interested in hearing what the, the student experience of using these technologies are. I, I know me, I as an educator, I, I use these technologies every day for my teaching and for my research and my writing. Um, but I'm, I'm particularly interested to see the student perspective on this and, and hearing that in some classes they feel they have to hide this. Right. And in others they're sort of ready to go to learn how to use this as a mm -hmm. tool. I, I, I'm, I'm interested on the student perspective on this. Then so maybe that's something we need to maybe do for the future. Right. Do you know of any AI uh, companies that have asked for any student input? Not that I know of, although I know one big AI sort of education initiative is with, uh, it's called Khan Academy. Mm. Um, they're, they're big already on YouTube with all sorts of um, educational content. Right. They've partnered up with the people who made ChatGPT, um, mm. OpenAI, to create a an educational sort of system in which you, on any manner of topic, the AI in a sense is a, is a tutor, is an assistant, is an instructor, and grades your work right there on the right. spot. Um, and they've used a ton of student feedback in putting that together. And so I think they're going to make a big splash maybe in the next year or so as that technology right. comes out. And, um, and I think there's a lot of um, endeavors happening right now about trying to put these into place. Absolutely. The only one that I was thinking as you were talking about was Grammarly that has oh, yeah. their AI and I can't remember what they call it, but I uh, went to some conference where they were talking about it, and they use mostly graduate student mm. feedback in the development of that Grammarly that, that the college uses to help with grammar and spell check and, and uh, students have access to. Uh, it also has an AI portion that are, can also be used by students yeah. as well as, as professors in the classroom. Are there any areas about AI and teaching that you're excited about looking forward into the future or things you're thinking about trying out in the future? I am really excited with um, the rise I see of academic research on how AI can be used pedagogically. Mm -hmm. I think up to this point, most of the publications out there about AI were mostly from a research uh, theoretical standpoint. And I know our article was in TextGen Ed, mm -hmm. which is one of the, the first mainstream publications, uh, top tier, a WAC journal to be published, but there's they're following that up with an, another call for papers, I think, within the next couple of months. And there's been, I've noticed on the, the call for papers as well as the what's getting published, there's a lot more um, application. And, and as someone, I'm really interested in the application more than the theory. Yeah. Um, how do we use this? And I'm, I was just at a conference last weekend um, looking at AI in terms of writing and the whole conference was focused on how do we use it in our writing mm -hmm. classes from freshman to doctoral level and everything in between. And so it was really interesting to me how many people in that conference were talking about how to use it to teach thesis statements. Mm -hmm. I personally have never used AI to teach thesis statements, but I'm interested to read that person's conference abstract and get a little bit more information in it. So I think I'm just really interested in, uh, in having people be thinking about how to use it and really improve student understanding, student writing, student um, comprehension, all the different educational impacts that AI can possibly po positively have. Yeah. Yes. One thing I'm excited about, um, although there's still a lot of work to be done, for one of the limits of AI is it knows what it knows, but it doesn't know how to communicate what it doesn't know in a sense. Right. There's some new um, approaches occurring where you can take um, external data, like all the presidents of the United States speeches, and then look, figure out how to feed information appropriately into the AI. So in a sense, you hook up an AI to the internet or to a database, and you help deal with some of those falsehood issues by feeding it information beforehand. Interesting. Um, so th there's some things coming online to try to make AI more truthful in a sense. And for me, the idea of connecting it to rich sort of content and sources mm -hmm. to um, to broaden the opportunities to work with students in, in exploring the past. That's one thing I'm, I'm really excited about. Absolutely. Um, I know you at, at the college here teach as well. Um, 
digital art, which is another right. big area that AI Huge. is transforming. Absolutely. Have you used anything, any of these um, AI image yes. making models? Absolutely. I, uh, in, I actually revised, after AI came out, I revised that course mm. to change it from, um, anyway, we use a lot of various digital art options, mm -hmm. but I really took many of those away, or I let people have options, but uh, there's a couple weeks specifically on like mid journey mm -hmm. and dream something mm -hmm. <laughs> so I think about them on the uh, there's a lot of AI generating um, that are free or, or give you a certain number that you can generate a day or a week or whatever and uh, what I'm really interested in is that you generate it by text mm -hmm. you type in your descriptions and by using words so from a writing perspective it's really interesting that using words to create images and um, I've had students you know, usually as an introduction, they just create whatever they want. Mm -hmm. And then I have them think about it from a business sense. If they are having to find stock photos, for example, mm -hmm. it used to be that you had to do a Google search to make sure that you were not violating copyright. And, and now a lot of times you can use AI to create those stock photos. And now the same implications are true that what is AI pulling from and to create those art. And so there are uh, some variety of copyright issues going on. Mm -hmm. And I like to have those conversations with students so they're aware of what it is. But I think there's a lot of implications and positive implications mm -hmm. of ways that AI art can be used from both an art perspective, but also within a business and a marketing perspective as well. Absolutely. I, and it was these applications that sort of drew me to AI in the first place. I mean, um, I, I teach here at the, uh, the college our digital humanities program, and one of the things I try to do is look for new technologies on the horizon. Mm -hmm. And when these first sort of AI art things started coming around a couple years ago, I was particularly drawn in because I love words, I love text, and I love images, but I have no artistic ability whatsoever. Like I can't draw <laughs> parallel lines. But I can put a phrase together. Right, And when I, when I did that, th these images were, really, were much better than anything I could produce, and I really right. enjoyed making them. Like I enjoyed making art for the first time. And, uh, and I, thought, I thought this would be infectious. So I've tried this with students. I, I will do sort of like an AI art show in a class where they'll oh, wow. um, create generations on whatever they want. Or um, when we study in, say, Western Civ, like moments like uh, abstract uh, and ro romanticism and poetry or art of the 19th and 20th centuries, I have them sort of create art of their interest in that sort of style mm -hmm. and that motif. So oh, very nice. And, and they react well, I think, to um, both exploring and learning about different artistic styles. Absolutely. But in a frame of reference that they really, you know, make sense to them. Absolutely. Well, now that we're getting creative, actually, mm -hmm. the, the, they just turned in their finals on Sunday. So from that digital art class and several of the more creative folks in there did a, a couple, I had a couple students write a book or a, a short, sh short stories or picture books, um, children's, and they did all of their images using AI. I had several, um, they could either do a portfolio or something creative, or um, a website. I had several of them create websites for either their own companies or for family member companies where they did all of their, um, all of the images using AI images. Um, I had someone who was involved in the theater who put together a series of, um, of images that, uh, that he felt were associated with the latest theater production. Uh, a lot of really interesting, mm -hmm. I also have all my students create memes. I love memes. <laughs> I love that intersection of visual and text. And there's a lot that you can do with memes uh, with AI as well. So yeah. absolutely lots of opportunities. Actually, I first found out about Mid Journey by following your Twitter account. <laughs> so. <laughs> And then I was like, oh my goodness, this is really cool what you're creating. And I, and, and, and here you. we are. Yes. Yeah, so thank you for that. And it's been, it's been a blast. It's been sort of a wild few years um, with all these technologies. Um, and I think, I think it's an exciting time, although, you know, it's, it's going to be some challenges too. I know some of our colleagues are concerned Absolutely. about some of the big, big, these, some of these big changes and how to adapt, how to adjust, how to react. But I think, um, you know, it, we'll have the good with the bad, but I think this will be a moment in which education will change, but um, there's some things about education that hasn't changed at all in 2,000 years, and I'm pretty sure a lot of those will endure just fine. Absolutely. And I, I think as we've, re as we've had, um, both of us are on the mm -hmm. committee, the AI 
uh, committee to mm. to help figure out for the college what was our official policies and mm -hmm. and largely left up to individual instructors to choose what they what they wanted to do or or not do with AI. Um, but we I think both of us have had quite a few conversations with faculty concerns about the ethical considerations as well as the plagiarism considerations of AI. And uh, I know that I had a conversation with multiple people that I said, you know, my during my childhood, teenage life, you know, you walk down the street and ask somebody to write an essay for you, right? Probably that retired English teacher sitting on the corner. Here, not that I did, but sure, sure. <laughs> the options were available. And it's just changed mm -hmm. um, throughout the years that I, I think cheating is, is something that is always going to be part of human nature. Mm -hmm. AI, does it make it easier? In some ways, yes. In some ways, no. I definitely, even having open conversations with my own students about cheating, about making sure that, yes, they can use chat GBT in various ways and very structured uh, instruction on that, I still find students who turn in essays that are completely generated through ChatGPT and having those conversations with those students about why that's not appropriate. I just think that these are conversations that have always been happening and will continue to happen and it's good to have open conversations with, um, with students, with professors as well, but that AI in and of itself is not inherently mm -hmm. negative. There's a lot of positive aspects that we can use AI in our yeah. classrooms. So how do you how do you keep track of all these changes and all these new developments that are coming out seemingly every day? Like what what are what are some sources or people that you like stay tuned to? to... Oh, you. <laughs> no, that's too much pressure. Uh, um, I find a lot, I, I, I also teach social media mm -hmm. on this, on this campus. And so I find a lot of it's coming through, uh, Twitter, mm -hmm. the, you know, Instagram, TikTok, all of our social media, yeah. Facebook. Um, I, I try to follow, um, trends. I'm on, uh, lots of different listservs, mm -hmm. um, very much listservs associated with AI and, I also look at what's happening in the research communities, uh, both in, in English and writing and social media. Those I look at calls for papers and things like that. I, I do sometimes find it to be overwhelming yeah. because there are so many new AIs constantly being developed mm -hmm. and being talked about and being lauded as this is our next great thing and then you know a couple months later nobody's heard of it anymore. Mm -hmm. It has uh, not been used. I mean there's been several that have, have opened with a great fanfare and, and now I can't find them. Right. <laughs> that they have folded, which I think is the nature of any new technology. Yeah, yeah. I think back to when the internet got started and all those websites that were, you know, billion dollar valuations and they're not here anymore. Right, uh, exactly. So it, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy time. Uh, for me, um, some, some places and some, you know, sources that have been useful for me. There's a professor at the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania named Ethan Ma uh, Malik, I think his name mm -hmm. is. Um, and he is a real expert in using this in the classroom. He's doing educational studies for using AI. And he's always got interesting things to say, and especially in how it can be applied. Um, and so he's, great. he's a resource I really like. Our colleagues at the Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., um, in the politics department, um, have come up with a really good document about the integration of Catholic, a Catholic education and AI. So if folks are interested in... Um, somehow Catholic institutions are addressing that. I, I would check that out. But I, it, it is overwhelming. We're in a moment of, I think, really rapid change. Um, and even I staying on Twitter way too much. It's, it's super hard <laughs> super hard to keep up with. So, um, but that's, that's part of the, the ferment of the moment, I guess. Absolutely, I'm looking at that. And I, I would say I have a, I've in the last several months have kind of slowed down and trying new ones mm -hmm. and, and go back to, mm the hallmarks, of, or not the hallmarks, but the chat GBT mm -hmm. and, and explain paper primarily to be using in my classes. Yeah. And, and I see, and the Grammarly one as well. I, I see these new ones and I, I think I've decided to step back a little bit. And, and I mean, there's a little so much going on I in know. life, right? And trying to stay on the, on the cusp of every new AI generated um, new program. It's, it's hard. Super hard, super hard. But it always so. What's other than ChatGPT and maybe explain papers? We mm -hmm. talked about that. What are what are some of your other favorites that you like to use? Um, so um, I should maybe note a conflict of interest here. There, there is a site that I really love. It's called Teaching Tools, 
and I, um, I worked with them to help develop one of their, their applications. It's called the brainstorming tool. It's for educators, it's for instructors. You, you put in um, the name of your class and the topic that you're teaching that day, and in about a minute and a half it'll come up with all this material that you can use for um, teaching lectures, uh, wow. tests, questions. So it is, in a sense, a teacher's friend in helping to um, generate useful, meaningful content for, for students. And I wish I had that my very first semester of teaching as a grad student right. all those years ago. Yes, um, so the good folks at Teaching Tool have a great, have a great um, resource there. Um, um, chat, I use ChatGPT every day oh, in, in ways big or small. I mean, if it's sometimes just to give a, a second look over an email or mm -hmm. something that I'm writing. Um, I find it particularly useful for me to think about things that I hadn't thought about before. So right. if you ask ChatGPT to, if you give them a sort of a question or a prompt and specifically ask ChatGPT, what are areas in which perhaps you haven't considered or had thought about, it'll, it'll, it's, it's great for brainstorming. And I need that sometimes, especially in keeping content fresh for me as I walk into the classroom and I've taught this, you know, 20 times. Right. How do I maybe come at this fresh angle that keeps the students engaged but keeps me engaged too? And I think Absolutely. AI is really useful for that. Yeah. I was thinking about as you were as you were talking. Uh, I teach a grant writing class, mm -hmm. and um, both at the undergrad and grad level. And and grant writing is an area that has just been um, overrun with with AI, right? Because no longer necessarily are, are you sitting down and writing a long grant. Mm -hmm. Now, Chat GBT action in my classes this semester. I had all my students put in. Uh, the grant they were applying to and what nonprofit they were potentially working for as we're um, and put in chat GPT and <laughs> within seconds yeah. we had and you could say how long you wanted it and how short and how specific and in for the most in most cases it did a, a fantastic job where so I was finding that where I used to be teaching all the different headings and all the different parts that go into a grant. Now I'm teaching how do we take ChatGBT, what it has created, and how do we work on editing it mm -hmm. to better meet the specific requirements of the grant, as well as taking some of that language that comes through as very, very computer-esque language, yeah. right? And how do we make it more that human interest language that is often that compelling argument. But grant, uh, freelance grant writing, for example, which I used to tell all of my students was a was a great opportunity to get some of their editing and writing skills in. I'm like, well, it still is, but it has changed. You need to know how to use ChatGPT if you are planning on going into grant writing. But yeah, if you want to be productive and competitive in a sense. Absolutely, you know? absolutely. No longer am I going to sit in front of a computer for hours on end writing you know, 100 pages of a grant when I can generate that same amount of writing mm -hmm. in a second. Yeah. And then it's it's really more of the, how do I go through and edit it. And I find a lot of times students, as well as myself, as I'm looking at it, once something's written, it's hard to think about how am I going to change it. But that so that's really what I've focused more of that class on is let's talk about how we do change those sentences, yeah. make them better, make them our own, make them fit with the with the nonprofits that we're working with, et cetera. But ChatGPT is very much revolutionized for good or for ill. I mean, there are definitely people who had been working as freelance non, or freelance grant writers have had to very much change um, what they're doing with that, with with the onset of ChatGPT. Yeah, and I think there's going to be big impacts too for um, commercial and freelance artists. And, Absolutely. Um, so it, there's going to be a ton of disruption, and and yeah, some of these fights over copyright are going to be definitely right. coming down the pipe. Um, one thing that I think about, though, is um, yes, there will be all these challenges and disruptions, and we, we've got to figure out as a society how to make this fair for everybody involved. Right. But, but my dad was a civil engineer, and he um, studied in the 1950s, and he kept all of his materials from college into his early career. And oh, wow. When he was started as a civil engineer, he had these gigantic volumes of logarithmic tables that he had to carry <laughs> around and look up mathematical calculations on the fly. Oh, my goodness. And then he showed me his mechanical calculator from the 1960s. And now, of course, doing calculations is no difficulty at all. Right. And it... Um, changed his life as a civil engineer for the better, making it simpler, making it more right. efficient, more productive. And maybe that can be something that, um, for all the disruptions, that can be helpful for us too. We can maybe 
do the business of education and students can do the business of writing and learning in ways that are more effective, more productive, but at the same time, um, we need to take a step and, and identify the things that are valuable for us. And Absolutely. Studying the past, learning how to communicate, how to write, how to Absolutely. appreciate literature. Yep. And so I think it's a time to um, welcome, critique these new technologies, but maybe sort of think real hard about first principles about what education is that in the first place. Oh, definitely. And I think there's a lot of very positive mm -hmm. um, educational um, you know, impact that can be made. And if we, you know, I think part of education uh, is change, right? Mm -hmm. Change is inevitable. Mm -hmm. Things are always going to change and they have been changing. Uh, although hallmarks are, are, you know, there are definitely things sure. that, are, that don't change as you said, 2000 years of education, mm -hmm. <laughs> but some things that, are, that stay the same. But I think um, um, change is always something that's happening and this is changing, there's, there's plenty of things about AI that are changing education mm -hmm. for the better. Absolutely. And, and the better for students and the better for learning and the better for comprehension and for communication and for writing. And so I'm really echoing you on this yeah. and saying that I'm really excited to see how this continues to develop. And Well, it seems like it's a great topic for, for this podcast. Conversatio is this Benedictine hallmark about conversation, about engaging. Mm -hmm in community and engaging with each other. And in a strange way, this technology allows us to engage in knowledge um, in a direct and sort of strange way. And so we should continue to have that conversation and engage in that Benedictine hallmark of conversatio as we figure out this new world of AI and um, our job in the classroom accordingly. I agree, definitely. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, so as we conclude, thank you for our audience for joining us. Uh, thank you, Daniel, for co-hosting it with me as well and for this wonderful conversation. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe and tell your friends uh, that this is available on Spotify, Apple, and Google Podcasts. Until next time, God bless.